Good afternoon, dear colleagues, distinguished audience. It is my pleasure to welcome you at the first dialogue in Romania following the release of the TEPSA volume, Climate Change and the Future of Europe, Views from the Capitals. This uh, event, thank you, Michael. Uh, this event is a result of the uh, excellent cooperation between the European Institute of Romania and the Trans-European Policy Studies Association. First of all, I would like to mention a few words about our institute's involvement in developing today's topics. Uh, the European Institute of Romania is an important player in the research process focused on climate change and circular economy. A few years ago, we have launched the first study of its kind on circular economy, and this year we have published the results of a research focused on youth and climate change. We have noticed an increasing interest towards these topics, and we aim to support both the decision makers and the general audience with evidence-based research findings. Moreover, we are working to increase the level of awareness on climate change by running training sessions for various target groups. This April, for example, we hosted a course for teachers on green competencies via Europe Direct Bucharest, and so we connected policy with practice regarding the European Sustainability Competence Framework. One key insight derived from this training, I have to tell that was the teachers are willing to develop their own green skills and to support the students they are working with. However, this should happen with adequate financial allocations and not only by personal commitment of those involved. It is our mission and of those like-minded institutions to continue to work on advancing the knowledge on European affairs and of voicing the concerns of the European citizens in the activities that we are running. As an institute uh, dedicated to promotion of uh, European values, we have been pleased to find in TEPSA an academic community working for the constant progress of the European project. And we appreciate your work in connecting visions from different EU member states and from other European countries. I would also like to congratulate my colleagues Eliza and Mihai for their work on this field and for their contribution to the book. Many thanks to all the speakers today and to the moderator for accepting our invitation. I wish you all fruitful and lively discussions. And now I would like to give the floor to our moderator, Mr. Michael Kedding, uh, honorary board member of the TEPSA, professor of European integration and EU politics at the University of Duisburg, Essen, Germany. Professor Kedding, Michael, you have the floor. Excellent. Thank you very, very much, Anna, uh, for your very kind introductory words and for the reflection on your ongoing work related directly to today's uh, panel on climate change and the future of Europe. I'm very honored to be today's moderator. I was already quickly introduced, so let's not waste any time um, on me and go straight into the topic. The topic of today being a very relevant one, climate change will not only determine the future of Europe, it has already been part of our present and it will definitely be part of our future. We just talked in the preparatory meeting we had about uh, the heavy rain you had in the western parts of your country, but devastating floods, droughts, uh, wildfires and deadly heat waves um, have actually unfortunately become reality uh, for most parts of our European continent. And we have started learning about the gravity of this uh, crisis uh, very much. The European Environment Agency is quoted as saying that one million people, almost one in seven inhabitants, are affected by either water scarcity, which even includes the south of Sweden, an area of Europe you would have probably not expected this to be the case. Now, for today's panel, we have uh, gathered uh, a very interesting group of experts, um, which I will introduce uh, very shortly. They will be given some time to give their comments, and then we will have an open Q&A session. For the Q&A session, we would like to treat uh, audio interventions as the primary means uh, for asking a question, though the chat will be open too. 
So could I therefore kindly ask the audience uh, to make use of the raise hands uh, function, and then I will call upon them each questionnaire's name as one would uh, in an in-person event, and it would be Eva, Eva Ribera, uh, who sits in the back with the TAPSA team managing the technologies of giving the attendees uh, the floor. A special thanks here to Ribera uh, and Eva, sorry, you and Artur from TAPSA uh, in Brussels. Now we have, um, um, Anna already mentioned this, um, um, it's basically linked to this launch of this book uh, where Elisa and Mihai uh, wrote um, a very informative, I have to say, because I didn't know anything about the situation with regard to climate change in Romania, a, a very um, thought provoking, uh, crisp to the point opinionated contribution, to the Romanian, so to say, perspective on this very matter. And this book, uh, which is one of the flagship activities of TAPSA and you being a very important member, um, provides 27 plus 12, so in total 39 contributions expressing opinions, uh, which provides a better understanding of um, national differences on this very matter across Europe about initial positions regarding the environmental challenges and it's, it's another, if you want, journey, a European journey um, through Europe of diverse, diverse approaches regarding climate policies. It's super interesting and easy readable because all those contributions are only four to five pages long. Uh, so if you want to know what's going on beyond Romania, I kindly invite you to have a thorough look. And with Without further ado, I would now introduce our panelists. And in this order, we will have also these interventions. We will start with uh, Elisa, uh, Elisa Vash, um, who is an EU affairs and NGO professional working on civil society and democracy, circular economy and climate change, uh, digital developments and youth policy. Um, Elisa is part of the European Institute of uh, Romania's team. The European Studies Unit since 2014, and in the national nonprofit sector, she's the vice president of Young Initiative Association, a Romanian NGO focused on empowering specifically young people and supporting the development of NGOs. At the European U level, you look um, and work closely with YMCA Europe as research and uh, reporting consultant. Happy to have you on board. Next to her, and that would be then the next person on my list, uh, giving a short introduction, and both of them are the authors of the Romanian chapter in this book on climate change and the future of Europe, is Mihai. Mihai um, Sebe is head of unit, uh, European Studies Unit at the European Institute of Romania and guest in, uh, instructor um, at the University of Bucharest. His areas of expertise are political sciences, international relations, contemporary history of Europe and Romania, the history of the European idea and the relationship between the Romanian and European politics, European affairs um, aficionado, as he is saying himself, and curious about the shape of things to come. He holds a PhD in political sciences from the University of Bucharest. Also happy to have you on board, Mihai. Next one then on my list would be uh, Ciprian um, Stanescu, who's running the Social Innovation Solutions Ecosystem, a group of organizations that aim to empower individuals and organizations to understand future transformations and to develop sustainable tech policy and entrepreneurial solutions. Uh, it runs a variety of educational programs and business competitions like Future Makers, Sustainability Academy, and Transformator. Um, and uh, Shibrian worked 12 years for global organizations like Ashoka and the Aspen Institute, is a global sh shaper alumni of the World Economic Forum, co-founder of Global Shapers Bucharest Hub, and a board member of Rethink Romania. Happy to have you on board as well, Ciprian. And last but not least, Alina. Um, Alina is a Romanian communication scholar, member of the advisory board of European Digital Media Observatory and um, of its task force on the war in Ukraine. 
She's also president of the board of the European Institute of Romania since 2015, uh, was a fellow at the Visegrad Insight, um, a visiting fellow at MINDA, the Gunzburg Center for European Studies at Harvard University in the US, member of the high level expert group on fake news and online uh, information for the European Commission and founder and European editor in chief of antifake.org. RO, a fact-checking and digital literacy portal, contributor in several Romanian media with articles and opinion pieces on disinformation technology and the new information ecosystem. Alina, glad to have you on board. And I know that I haven't really done all justice to what you have been doing so far, but I hope that these short overviews give a, just a glimpse of what you have been doing and what you and the reasons for why you are here. And with this and further ado, I would now hand over to you, the panelists, the centerpiece of today's event, starting with Elisa, going then right to Mihai, then to Ciprian, and then to Alina. The floor is yours, Elisa, please. Thank you so much for, for the presentation offer and for introducing our uh, distinguished uh, panelists. Uh, thank you to all those 50 attendees that are currently following the debate, uh, being uh, here in the, in Zoom, and uh, hello to everyone who's uh, watching the, the live uh, transmission of this event. I have a couple of slides that uh, I will be using uh, to support my presentation. Everything all right from visual? Great, thank you so much. Uh, climate change just from Romania. Firstly, I would like to say uh, a big thank you for um, inviting us to be part of this, this volume. It was the first exercise of this uh, kind since we have joined the TEPSA network. And it was uh, definitely uh, a very intriguing uh, exercise for us to think about uh, a complex issue such as climate change and all the elements that it entails. Um, but to present the, the main uh, conclusions in uh, just a couple of pages and in, uh, in a style of writing that is easy to be understood by uh, anyone who is uh, interested uh, in this subject. Um, we have um, titled our contribution to, to this volume um, by addressing um, Romania's contribution to uh, the European uh, ambitious targets while facing deep-rooted uh, sectoral flaws. When we have uh, thought about this title, of course, in accordance with what has been written uh, in our contribution, we were thinking, isn't this a bit too critical, maybe, or a negative uh, perspective? And then when we have received uh, the volume and we have um, uh, went through all the contribution, contributions uh, uh, written by the, the colleagues from other states, uh, we have observed that this is a general feeling that has been shared also by, uh, by other writers. Uh, of course, glimpses of uh, optimistic attitudes exist in different, uh, in different cases, but uh, it seems that the general overview is uh, in a more critical one, as everyone is trying to address the, the practical issues that um, uh, are included uh, in the topic of, uh, of climate change, and not just the theoretical part that might be used in order to, to frame the discussion. So um, the reasons for which we have uh, chose this title was to uh, firstly mention the fact that Romania endorses the green transition and it contributes to achieving the European targets. And then to say that it's important to have in mind the particularities of the member states when implementing and adapting the legislative uh, framework. And thirdly, that in the case of different countries, so it's not only Romania, but all other countries, both from the European Union and uh, from other parts of Europe, there are different sectoral flaws that influence the, fi the fight we uh, are currently running against climate change and the related measures for mitigation and uh, adaptation. Just a few uh, targets that we have um, at the national level, which uh, are part of the integrated uh, national energy and climate plan. 
uh, what we have committed to do since uh, 2030. I'm not going to um, uh, present them uh, in details, just to have them uh, here as a base for, for our discussion. I would like to refer uh, to, to the practical aspects, to the particularities that characterize uh, our case. Uh, firstly, it has been widely debated at the European level, especially when we had the discussions on what should be uh, introduced uh, as, uh, as targets for the next year, uh, years, uh, the use of uh, gas as uh, a transition fuel. So why is this, um, why is this uh, an, an issue we need to think about? Almost half of the Romanian households use wood for heating, and most of them are in rural areas where alternative sources are lacking. And this is why in the past year, different authorities from all around Romania have uh, sent project applications to receive funding uh, either to modernize the existing or to create new gas infrastructure over the next uh, few years. Of course, it might seem counterintuitive in the broader framework, but at the same time, it's important to consider that the public funds to support the installation, for instance, of solar panels or, or heating pumps are rather limited. Thus, it's really difficult for individual consumers to access the financial resources needed to update their heating uh, systems. Uh, at the same time, uh, in this case, it's important to um, have in mind the fact that one opportunity that could derive from modernizing uh, and um, extending the gas infrastructure, the natural gas infrastructure in Romania, would be that of seeing how hydrogen could be uh, injected in the installations in, in the following years. So I think it's important to say uh, this um, uh, policy, um, both in terms of uh, addressing the real needs of the citizens and the pressing needs that they have, both in terms of, okay, how we could use this infra infrastructure for the next years in order to uh, move towards uh, uh, green um, energy uh, resources. Uh, in terms of facing deep-rooted sectoral flaws, there are several subjects that could be uh, pointed out uh, on, on this, but we have chosen to uh, introduce uh, the one that it tackles transport because uh, it ranks the third in, uh, in the sectoral shares of greenhouse gas emissions here in Romania. And we have major vulnerabilities regarding the vehicle fleet, which is one of the oldest in the EU. What has happened in the past decades was that secondhand vehicles from Western Europe have been subject to a widespread importing into Romania. Thus, this should also represent the key uh, insight for, for the next years, especially uh, at the level of the European Union, to think about the measures of um, trying to counter uh, changes that might uh, import pollution from one state to another. Because uh, as it shows here with, uh, with the secondhand vehicles, maybe it wasn't such a big problem uh, afterwards for Germany. There are many cars coming from there, but it became a higher problem for, for, the, uh, for Romania as a whole, as uh, there were uh, a lot of uh, polluting uh, cars uh, in, uh, in this case. Um, what should be done uh, in according to, to our contribution, and we have uh, titled these points of action, uh, firstly, is to frame climate change as a social, economical, cultural, environmental, and political issue. For many years, climate change has been uh, framed in the political discourse as being uh, a problem that tackles uh, environment that tackles nature, and it wasn't associated with the economic and uh, social factors. And this is why when we are looking at the Eurobarometer survey, for instance, to see which are the most uh, pressing issues for, for the citizens, uh, the um, economic well-being, the, the, their level of, um, um, of addressing, the, for instance, the monthly expenses, might be the first uh, the first thing to to have in uh, in mind and from this point of view it's really hard to think what you're going to do in the next 5 to 10 years in in terms of addressing climate change when you have to think what you're going to do till the end of the month in order to ensure uh, all the expenses so for climate change to have 
bigger success and to be more anchored in uh, in the public debate, we think it's really important to, to frame it uh, as a social and economical uh, issue. And then with the cultural, uh, the cultural factor, uh, as we have addressed, uh, for instance, the, the situation with the heating through, through wood, uh, we think it's also important to have in mind these particularities uh, that are uh, common to uh, a certain type of states. So it's not, uh, it's not just the environment and, and the political issue, but also the cultural particularities. Then we think it's important to increase the general level of knowledge among the citizens on climate change and circular economy. Uh, and here, if we were to, uh, for instance, use um, data that have been retrieved from states such as the United Kingdom, uh, last year I have uh, participated to, to a working group on climate change, and we have discussed uh, some numbers. For instance, in the UK, as we uh, many of us might look as a country who's more developed in, in this field, uh, two out of 10 people knew how to um, uh, define circular economy. So what, how, what's the situation like in countries that are not yet familiarized with, uh, with this concept and what should be done forward? Uh, next, we think it's important to support the development of green competencies among citizens of all ages. For instance, in Romania, we have piloted in the past year the Green Week, which was a very good initiative, both for teachers and for uh, students to become acquainted with subjects related to climate change and circular economy. But unfortunately, as Juana was mentioning in, in the beginning, it was based on the financial uh, commitment of those involved without having specific resources, uh, for instance, uh, in invested in this case. So it was up to parents, it was up to teachers to find the necessary funds in order to organize activities who, uh, which were uh, focused on, uh, on the topic of climate change. Uh, then, as we have observed what is happening, for instance, in the field of um, photovoltaic uh, panels, uh, solar panels, heating pumps, um, and the differences that are between the rural and the urban areas, we think it's important to create large-scale projects that can be implemented locally with the purpose of renovating and modernizing the households. Because, for instance, nowadays, if you want to apply for a project in order to receive funding for photovoltaic panels, uh, it's not just to install those panels, but you also need to do some changes in the electrical grid of the house and, of course, some renovation in order to uh, uh, integrate this. So while the funds are currently just for the photovoltaic uh, panels, maybe in the future uh, some additional support should also be uh, invested in uh, in the part of renovating and modernizing uh, households. And um, following the debate uh, on this subject, is we think it's important to provide uh, transparent and easy to access information on how, how households can apply for such funding and offer free guidance to citizens that require assistance in developing an application. Uh, for instance, when we had uh, the last uh, session of uh, funding for the photovoltaic uh, panels, the funds uh, were, um, were uh, accessed or uh, the, the applications uh, ran out in about 10 minutes or something like that. So the level of uh, interest among the citizens is really high, but the level of funding is not so high, so it, it matches uh, the, um, the needs of the citizens. And of course, here, the, for instance, the citizens who come from more, um, uh, from urban areas, uh, from areas that have more access to information, they are the ones who usually uh, can uh, commit to, to build this application and have the, the necessary information. But people who, who come from uh, medium to um, uh, small uh, communities, be it communes or, uh, or villages, it might be very difficult for them to understand the financing guide and to uh, know how to prepare all the documents uh, involved uh, in this process. And lastly, uh, we, we thought it was really important to send a message throughout our contribution that we need to connect uh, policy with practice. It's not enough just to talk about what, which are the targets that we have 
at uh, the national level, the um, way we have managed to, to tackle the subject so far, what do we plan to do uh, in the future? We think it's important to talk about real life situations, especially when they represent um, cases that uh, are recurrent and to bring forward the way that citizens are trying to um, participate in this uh, process of adapting uh, and mitigating the effects of uh, climate change. Thank you so much. Excellent. Thank you very much, Elisa, for your uh, input. We would go straight to the next panelist, which is Mihai. For all the um, visitors to this uh, panel, just keep your questions in the back of your mind. You might want to start writing them down in the chat or afterwards raise your virtual hand. But without further ado, Mihai, please. Thank you very much, Michael. And I would like to thank all my colleagues for the support provided so far in doing this uh, presentation and this event. As my colleague Elisa pointed out the technicalities of the climate change and its impact on Romania, I would like to add more some key lines that may help shape our debate and provide a wider, more political context of the matter. First of all, I think that we should all be on the same page and accept the fact that climate change is a reality. It is a mega trend and that by 2030, we can be in a situation that can be defined as simple as that. We are harder, as an EU funded report uh, stated about how world, the world will look in 2030. Basically, the estimate is that the world would be 1.5 degrees warmer than during pre industrial times. And this leads us to the elephant in the room, meaning the fact that the discussion about climate change is, in my personal opinion, it's not necessarily a technical discussion, but it is also a discussion about politics or mostly about politics and about the society where we would like to live in 10 years time. If in a couple of years ago, the discussion about climate change was rather unpopular and left mostly to the technical experts, now as the climate change effects are felt by, both by the public and the policymakers alike, we assist to the appearance of some deep societal concerns. As a result, we are now in a period where previously unpopular decisions that may curb the emissions may become easier to take and to implement. Yet at the time, we are still having political systems that are not undergoing the necessary changes in order to mitigate the effects of climate change. And we need to have in mind that we at European level, we are heading toward the next year European Parliament elections. And climate change and climate change policies are going to be one topic of the agenda with both pros and cons. When we speak about climate change, for instance, in Romania, we need to have in mind that climate change is, is not necessarily just academic subject, but it is also a legal topic. And uh, I want to mention to our many audience, but also to abroad, I think that we have not included in the report, meaning that by constitution, at least in Romania, the state is must secure the environmental protection and recovery, as well as preservation of the ecological balance and the state acknowledges the right of every person to a healthy, well-preserved and balanced environment. Therefore, we have, first of all, from the constitutional point of view, these provisions that might orient any discussion if we want to give it in a legal framework. Also, climate change is also about geopolitics. All too often, the discussion is being centered on what national states in the European Union and what European Union as such is doing. But we need to have in mind that we are in a dance and it is not just a tango, but it's a rather more complex dance with three main actors that are responsible and can influence the direction where policies go concerning climate change, meaning Europe, the United States and China, and that no one of these actors can succeed by its own. Only jointly can this challenge be met. 
Also, climate change in Romania, and I believe elsewhere, it's also about planning and post-social impact. When I speak about planning, it, it implies the fact that we can no longer design cities and villages like we used to before, and that urban planning, for instance, is becoming much more important as we need to mitigate the impact of climate change. Also, the extreme weather conditions that accompany climate change will affect even uh, stronger the other populations. And as we all know, Europe is in a rather bad shape from the demographical point of view. Also, hotter temperature will mean a drop in productivity and even more emissions at, for instance, the use of air conditioning is going to become much more important. Climate change discussion is also debate that needs to take into consideration the security risk, both for national defense, for instance, and questions related with migration, because climate change sometimes is not felt the same in different places in the world. And there are some regions of the world where climate change is felt more. And this may generate what some experts in the area call a climate uh, change migration. And climate migration might just come up on top of the agenda in five to 10 years time. Also, climate change is about what type of society we want. We want, let's say, a society where everyone is off fend for themselves, or on the contrary, we are more focused on a society where no one is left behind. And that implies that fairness and affordability should be at the heart of any policies meant to mitigate the effects of climate change. Because if we don't have national policies, European policies that benefit all European sectors and regions, we are going to have a very strong opposition, political and societal one as people with low and medium income are often more vulnerable to the impact of climate change. And also, if we add to this perfect storm, the upcoming digital revolution and the digital transition, we are going to have the ingredients of a very important social, let's say mayhem that may or may not occur. Climate change and digital revolution in the same time, this might just be something that it may be a, politis, a political scientist dream, but it may prove to be a societal nightmare. Also, the discussion about shifting to a greener economy is a painful step that needs to be better explained and needs to be better, let's say, supported by state policies and also by other relevant stakeholders. Add to this the increase of both water and food insecurity and we have another uh, geopolitical aspects in the agenda. Moreover, climate change, it's also about inequality. Unfortunately, we are not all affected in the same time, in the same manner. First of all, we have an inequality concerning the damages that are incurred by climate change. As mentioned before, some regions, some countries are more affected by climate change, if you see in Romania. Some regions in Romania may suffer greater and stronger effects of the climate change than other counties in Romania. And then we have the question of inequality of contribution. Not everyone pays the same in order to mitigate the effects of climate change. And also one final inequality on the agenda, it's about the ability to act. Larger countries, larger counties, larger cities have better means to mitigate the effects of climate change by smarter policies, by taking actions, while the more impoverished countries in Romania and elsewhere are going to be more affected on that. Add to this, let's say the inter internal migration or internal mobility of population going from, let's say, poor region affected by climate change to richer ones, could only aggravate this inequality. Also, climate change is about cost, it's about money, and we should have in mind how these costs are going to be split, who is going to pay a larger part of the bill required to mitigate the effects of climate change. And we should also have in mind how can we better evaluate the cost 
in my money of the climate change effect because sometimes the cost of climate change is largely underestimated. We need to have in the same time a better working relation between the local, national and European level in climate change because if we speak about at national level, for instance, we can have, let's have the ability to use better the money because we are closer to the problem. But the European level, for instance, may provide a way how to put into common the risk and think at a larger scale because climate change and the climate change associated policies are not necessarily just local policies, but need to be global policies. So basically the idea that I like to have at the end of the intervention is that the climate related decisions will determine not only the future of the economy and but also the future of the society and the decision that they are going to take in the next five to ten years are going to impact also our democratic system and we need in the same time to manage the expectation because as mentioned earlier European Union Romania whatever member states of the EU will not be able to curb the effects of the climate change alone, but it will need to be a collective action in order to do that. So having in mind this geopolitical, economical, social and regulatory factor, it's key if we want to identify the best solution. Because otherwise, we are going only to come up with very technical solutions that may not cover the real scale of the problem. And if we are losing the focus and the attention that our action and policies have on the society, on the population, then we risk to have a backlash that will affect us all. So having in mind the welfare of the population and how to maintain the current lifestyle, how to maintain the economic growth while taking necessary measure, now, this is going to be a really interesting challenge for the years ahead. So this is the main, let's say, political takeaway. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mihai, for um, this informative uh, contribution. And without further ado, uh, we would continue with uh, Ciprian. Uh, running currently the Social Innovation Solutions Ecosystem, a group of organizations that aim to empower individuals and organizations to understand future transformations. Climate change fits here yeah. very nicely. Ciprian, please. Lovely. Thank you so much. And, and thanks a lot to both Elisa and Mihai. And uh, I just realized about 20 years ago, uh, just a bit more than 20 years ago, I had my first internship and I spent uh, some time, a couple of months, if not two years, with the institute. So it's you know it's great to be back and to see at least one hour from uh, those days uh, running this uh, splendidly. Now, um, as I am a big fan of conversations, I will uh, be the disruptor of the panel um, and actually uh, want to actually ask. So I have a lot of things to say, but I want to ask Elisa and Mihai uh, something. Uh, I read their their the pages that they wrote. Um, and I find them very informative, but I would like to ask them, you know, in short, what are some of the things that in your research surprised you? What, are, what is something about climate change in Romania that made you, you know, surprised? I'm not saying uh, from a, you know, positive or negative perspective, but, but you know, what surprised you in, in what you, you did there? Well, I could go first. So, for instance, uh, following the news on the, the round of applications for, for the photovoltaic uh, panels, um, I, I think one, one surprising fact was uh, in relation to, to the level of knowledge that exists. I was uh, surprised to see, for instance, that uh, many people living in urban, well-developed areas did not know that there are funds available for this and they have uh, started to uh, implement projects on their own. Uh, second, uh, when it comes to the rural areas, uh, I was not so surprised, but kind of surprised that this attitude still continues with the level of trust in applying for this type of funding. 
um, many uh, different people I, I spoke to uh, for fundamenting uh, this contribution were a bit, um, let's say, reluctant to, to apply for funding, saying that it will take uh, a lot of time till they will receive the funds. Uh, or they will have to uh, ensure some financial commitments uh, by by their own. Uh, having these experiences uh, in, in mind, I think uh, at this moment, it's very important to invest in the level of knowledge uh, and awareness uh, regarding the instruments that we have. Because for instance, as you are doing uh, with the Climate Change Summit and with the other initiatives, uh, run at the social innovations. Um, there are different things happening nowadays. There are different initiatives belonging to, for instance, to the business sector or to the nonprofit sector, but the level of awareness and of information regarding these initiatives is quite low. And it's not only uh, enough to work on the information side, but also an awareness side, but also to work on the level of uh, trust in applying yeah. for, for different facilities. Yeah. We're going to go to Mihai for, for maybe a brief answer, and then I, I will react to, to what yeah. you said and then carry on. Uh, what surprised me is the fact that I was reminded, in fact, that we have the basic legislation needed to tackle climate change. That's why I mentioned the aspect in the constitution. We have these aspects about state obligation to provide a proper environment to the citizens. And this in mind should alone make the authorities and the stakeholders to act. We are not necessarily needed to reinvent the wheel here, but we just need to start to apply the uh, what we already have. And as mentioned, Elisa, it's a question of trust and also in a way the very local thinking of uh, many people because we still cannot perceive that climate change is something that is connected globally and that we need to take action, but not only just a local plan, but also in a bigger picture. So this is the first. So basically, we have the legislation, the main points. So having this obligation to have a clean environment, we should also be able to put it into practice. We don't, the final details can be discussed later on, but we have the main support from the legislation to do that. It will be up to us to act. Yeah, good. Now, uh, that's a good introduction for me as well. And, and I have a lot of things that I wanna say. I'll try to be as brief as possible. Um, and, and I would start with something that Mihai said in the last two minutes, which is about uh, local versus regional versus global or European. And we do believe at, at CIS, at Social Innovation Solutions, that climate change has no borders. And therefore, it is uh, absurd to uh, just think that in, in uh, county terms or in national terms or even in regional terms, we will really be able to fix it. Um, we had a, um, a poster in Times Square last year uh, in, in New York um, about the Climate Change Summit where it said uh, climate change has no borders. And we really believe um, that is uh, true to who we are and what we are. Uh, I have three points that I want to make, uh, and I will actually share with you some data from a study that we do every August and September. We have not done it yet, obviously, although it feels like August sometimes when it comes to temperatures, right? So first of all, uh, I would like to refer to some of the things that were mentioned by Elisa and that I encourage everyone to read at least the Romanian uh, if not the whole book, but the Romanian section. It's super short, it's gonna take you five minutes uh, and you will learn more than, than you would do. Would be. First, uh, then second, a bit about some of the, of the things that we've seen at Climate Change Summit uh, with a focus on 2030. And then the third is an invitation to support our work in creating the a legislative, legislative package called Legia Clima, or, or better said, the climate law, um, a panel and uh, a lot of work that we put in uh, a panel in October 20 on the second day of uh, Climate Change Summit. Now, first, uh, Climate Change Summit is often seen as a threat and in a very 
or I'd rather say dramatic uh, and negative perspective, which is true. It's, it's very dramatic without a doubt. Uh, but at the same time, it is not seen or it's rarely seen through the two lenses of solutions and opportunities. Um, I work more uh, in the field of SMEs, entrepreneurship, uh, and large corporates and, and public policy. And I do see um, in Romania, at least, uh, a not enough, uh, what I would call a radar of opportunities when it comes to climate change. And I'm not just talking about the basic uh, green economy that you might think of, which is usually referred to as solar panels, and that's all. Uh, there is a huge array of opportunities that many businesses and even citizens are missing. Um, uh, in when it comes to energy, energy efficiency, all the way to agriculture, packaging, circular economy, and all the other topics that, that uh, we see flourishing, at least in Central and Eastern Europe, where we're most active. But looking at the threats, um, I will take the perspectives of politics, SMEs, and citizens. Now, for politicians, climate change is either a threat or a political tool on both sides. You can say because of climate threat, and Alina will later on say how perhaps how some use Brussels as a political a weapon. So, you know, climate change, because of climate change, we need to do that and that. But in the same time, more and more parties will use climate change as a hoax and say climate change is not real. We should not do that and that and that. Why should we close our minds and the infamous and, or amazing Romanian industry where and, and spend the money on insects and eating insects? You know, all the, the speech that we see a lot in the past years, and we will see a lot or even more in the next years, all the way to using climate change as a scapegoat or not necessarily climate change, but the measures that we need to take on both sides, either po uh, power and opposition, uh, from infringements all the way to uh, issues related to taxation, uh, which bring more money to the budget. Um, I think the political sphere uh, is um, affected, but also uses climate change in various ways. Then when we look at citizens, um, I think we are living in the, in the past two to three years um, in, in a sort of a season of awakening for the citizens. It is, the, in my view, I think this is the first time when citizens have finally uh, touched uh, two hugely important issues. Climate change, because it's getting really warm, right? And AI, because you can finally use it. Uh, whatever AI might mean from a tech perspective, People have now the opportunity to use AI as either for free or very cheap, and they can really sense uh, what climate change looks like. Uh, maybe we were in denial, or maybe the effects were not that strong in the past, but now finally it's catching up, right? And then when we look at SMEs and businesses, uh, I really believe these are the most affected actors of society. Of course, SMEs are people, uh, so it's not they're not a separate category, um, but they do feel the strong effects uh, when it comes to broken supply chains, when it comes to prices that are abnormal uh, for their production due to various types of climate. Um, I just, you know, if you look at agriculture, I'm going to give you a very short example of a company that produces uh, eco and bio uh, uh, agricultural products, in particular grain. Uh, 2021, they had a 7 million euro turnover. 2022, a 1 million turnover because of rain, that's all. They have irrigation, they have everything, but that's not enough. So we are still prisoners of not just geography and geopolitics, but also climate. And we will see that more and more in the future. In the same time, especially for large corporates, but soon enough for SMEs, when we look at Brussels, again, there's a significant amount of regulation and legislation that comes, um, in particular related to sustainability metrics and how the companies face or look at, at, at climate change. Um, towards the end of my, my 
let's say I wouldn't say presentation. If I can just have these the share screen opportunity, that would be great. I know I said I don't have a presentation, but I made something on the spot. Uh, so perhaps Eva or Juana, lovely. Thank you so much. Um, and because we were talking about citizens, right? Let me just give uh, you full screen, and uh, I guess you can see this, right? Uh, so this is a a national study, uh, urban, rural. Uh, you have all the data on the far right um, um, corner. Um, this is for 2022, and we're very curious what 2023 brings. But the difference is marginal because we've done this in 2021 and 2020. Uh, we do see that Romanians are very aware about climate change. The large majority believes that it exists, and a, and the large majority of this majority believes that it has an impact, an effect. Uh, the deniers are not that many. Um, and even if we would do this like a referendum and all Romanians, or all, all probably 17 million able to speak Romanians would be asked, do you believe climate change exists? Uh, I dare to say that at least 75 to 80% would say yes. So we don't have a challenge in saying it's there. Where we do have a challenge is changing individual behaviors. And I'm not talking about politicians or companies. I am really talking about how citizens behave when it comes to waste management, when it comes to what they buy, and when it comes to how they understand um, uh, the consumption of energy that they have. Um, when they when Romanians look into the future, and this was very, very um, weird, that is a very unacademic term, but it was weird. Last year and this year, or last two years ago and last year, the main attitude that Romanians believe we should have in the next 15 years is to be more environmentally friendly. They had almost 16 types of, let's call them attitudes to pick from. Uh, this is number one, which is surprising, but it's very encouraging in the same time. Um, this is in Romanian. I'm not going to go through all of it. I'm just going to put the, my finger on two uh, data uh, of it, which is about age. This is on the left uh, bottom corner, let's say. Um, when it comes to optimism about um, solutions, about whether we can make it happen, etc., the young population between you know 25 and 34 or even more than that are rather well you can see the data there so there is a strong um let's say opinion among the young people that um we cannot really find a solution uh and this is the troublesome uh, part of it and then if you go on the um right part of the section, um, there's two very um, interesting perceptions. Um, if you go deeper into the conversation with these people, and we have put about 100 of them, we realize that they don't really understand what taxation means. But 70% of them say we should tax polluted pollution products or products that pollute, we should tax them more. When we ask them, but that means that the price will increase, they said, oh, no, 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 no. Second of all, uh, renewable energy uh, is, you know, 75% of them say this should be the predominant uh, energy in Romania. But when you go and say, well, yes, but, you know, that would be technically impossible in the next 20 years, and we need to do this transition and use uh, even coal, but use gas, they understand a bit more. So I agree with Elisa that we need significantly more education. Um, when it comes to climate issues that uh, Romanians are most concerned with, you can see here uh, the, the I mean, almost at equal numbers, uh, impact on agriculture, air pollution, and, and temperature increase. Uh, in large cities like Bucharest, Timisoara, Cluj, Iași, the number one was air pollution, obviously, by a huge margin. Um, and obviously, in the rural areas, uh, impact on agriculture was about 92 percent, uh, with with uh, all the others being uh, detrimental. Um, just uh, two things. Um, I think Mihai or Elisa who said 
um, something about 1.5%, I think, uh, Mihai, right? Um, data shows that we are past that. Um, and um, in a conversation, a recent conversation with one of the participants in this, which is the climate scenarios for 2030, the Climate Change Summit uh, event, and I'm just gonna uh, leave this here so that you understand a bit. I think, yeah, I can just leave it here. You don't need to read, but if you want to read in Romanian and you have really great eyes, read it. But this is how the report looks. Um, the problem that we have seen with experts, uh, in particular environmental experts, is that what they say in the past two years, it, they, they are wrong. They, are, they were wrong, completely wrong. Because in the mid 2000s, 2010, 20, 2005, 2010, 2015, their assessments for 20 or 2025 are wrong. They were more optimistic than the reality shows. Now, having this in mind uh, um, and uh, leaving you with a dramatic sight of the future, uh, if the experts say that they were wrong about this year and it's worse than what they assumed, think about 2030 uh, and when you see uh, 1.5, maybe we'll make it, just assume it's two, two degrees and things will actually be worse, uh, not better. At this point, and I'm gonna end with a sort of optimistic note, um, I really believe as a non-expert, but I talk to a lot of people, right? Um, that we have lost the battle for a cleaner 2030, but we still have a chance with 2035, 2040. And I'm going to pass it on to Alina to uh, put some uh, truth to everything that we have all talked about so far in the post-truth era, of course. Yes, excellent. Thank you very much for this input. And yes, take the invitation, Alina, and go straight uh, <laughs> to it. Uh, happy to have you on board as well, please. Yes, thank you very much. First of all, uh, let me uh, congratulate our dear colleagues from the Romanian uh, Institute, uh, European Institute of Romania, Elisa and Mihai, who are both also dear friends of mine, and I sincerely congratulate them for, be, for being part of this uh, debate and for actually placing them, themselves at the heart of the European debate by their contribution. So I'm really proud of their contribution. And also let me congratulate all of you, all the contributors to the volume as such. I'm very glad that we host this event, which is really a debate as Ciprian mentioned. And I'm really glad that I can add my emerging expertise about climate change communication and disinformation to, to, to our conversation. Uh, I think it was a matter of good chance that uh, I speak somehow the last because really I think that the subject of climate change communication and fighting disinformation um, is an all encompassing one and you all made somehow references to it. Um, what I can add to the conversation about Romania and about some parts of the Central and Eastern Europe is that I think that uh, climate change means or disinformation is a real issue. I think that the uh, public opinion results that Ciprian showed are uh, real, are definitely valid. But I think that if we go deeper into the discussion and we, we measure, for example, climate change competence, we could come up with uh, some surprising results. So I'm familiar with the public opinion shows, uh, polls showing that most of the Romanians think that uh, uh, climate change exists. But uh, if you go into, into measuring the uh, narratives, we try to, to, to minimize the impact or the urgency of climate change, we come up with a somehow different story. And uh, in Romania, according to the research that I have in, in that I have done in Romania and uh, the research that is in line with uh, uh, um, research at the whole level of the European Union by Edmo, for example, there, there are four main narratives, uh, climate change, disinformation and misinformation, and uh, they are often, they travel in correlation with one another. Uh, the first denies not necessarily the existence of climate change, but the human role in it. 
So it is some sort of a relative denialism. So, okay, we agree that climate change exists, but we are not sure we are debating whether the human factor is the most important one. The second one, the third, second narrative accuses the traditional media of spreading unjustified panic. I mean, oh, why are we so panicked about it? The third one attacks renewable energies, electrical vehicles, and recycling, saying that they do not have an impact on solving the issue, that there are, these are progressive, uh, hyper-progressive things, and again, they do not contribute to, fight, to, to solving the problem. And the fourth narrative attacks the climate movement overall, accusing it of hypocrisy or downright stupidity. You know, I mean, I am addressing our Romanian audience about Andrew's jokes about uh, Greta, uh, so as some sort of a symbol of this kind of uh, hypocritical or downright, downright stupid climate movement. So I think that these things exist in Romania. And again, if we measure, if we measure the simple question, do you believe that climate change exists? Most of the population will say yes. Uh, because, and also if we measure the willingness of people to make personal changes in order to contribute to finding the problem, I think that, that the willingness is uh, very, very low in uh, Romania. Uh, I think that, uh, um, and also I would say that after the pandemic, I do not have the data after the pandemic, but I think that after the pandemic, I, we can also see some reemergence of the old hard denialism that climate change doesn't exist, that it is a hoax, that it is a problem that is invented by the global elite. So, uh, borrowing from the claim from the uh, from the vocabulary that that try to deny the existence of the pandemic. So, I think that in terms of public opinion in uh, Romania and I would say the, across uh, the whole Central and Eastern Europe, the situation is a little bit more complicated. Uh, from from this point of view of climate change denialism, misinformation, and disinformation. Uh, in what what can we do about it? And uh, again, our colleagues Eliza Mihai and also Ciprian, by his uh, very heavy involvement in the topic, have also provided some answers. I completely agree with all what Eliza said that uh, um, many measures have to do with communication, with strategic communication, with shaping public opinion. I completely agree with the solution to increase awareness and the level of knowledge. And um, but again, we have to increase awareness and the level of knowledge in a very, very sophisticated way, because my assumption or even my fear is that if climate change really becomes a public topic issue debated in the public sphere, it is it has the potential to become a very, very polarizing issue. So try, right now, public opinion uh, polls show a good level of knowledge of presumably good knowledge about climate change. But at the same time, the, the, uh, uh, if it becomes a hugely popular topic, it may become a very polarizing one. So yes, we have to increase awareness and especially the level of knowledge. Um, and to make it a public issue, but pay, paying attention to the fact that once an issue becomes public, it, it has the potential to become very, very polarizing. The second idea, and of course it penetrated all your uh, speeches and I completely agree with you. I think that transparency and trust are paramount. Ciprian made references to the idea that uh, fighting global climate change is weaponized in the Romanian public discourse also. For example, oh, this Brussels, this elite, this uh, uh, Schwab and the uh, great resetters want to, want to impose this agenda and want to steal our economic resources. So you have to build a lot of transparency and you have to build a lot of trust and to avoid the temptation to change the topic into a political uh, weapon. The first solution, I think that innovation is key. Uh, I, as, uh, as you, Michael, said, I run a, a fact-checking portal. Uh, one communication product is green anti-fake. 
and it is a fact-checking portal that tries to debunk a lot of myths about climate change, but also to present a lot of news and latest developments in terms of innovation, social innovations, uh, solutions that have been found that can be escalated to the economic sector. So I think that again, so innovation in general, technological, social innovation are key in order to solve this uh, problem. And the fourth solution, I think that we should, uh, of course, this, this reflects my professional bias, but I think that we have to invest in what it is an emerging discipline, which is climate change communication. In general, people think that since they, they are able to speak, they are experts in communication. Excuse me, maybe it sounds a little bit arrogant. Public communication as a, as a, in general is a, is a very, very rough discipline. But again, I now I read a lot about climate change communication and this is an emerging uh, discipline. Uh, for example, I have uh, read about the fact that um, weather forecasts in French television become, have, be, have started to become one, one of the main TV shows and they are used not to present the weather or to forecast the weather, but to build awareness about why the weather looks the way it is and to spread a lot of information about climate change. So this is a complete innovation in journalism. Data visualization is another a complete innovation in climate change communication because you have to communicate a lot of data to provide visual stories. And yet, as Elisa rightly underlined, you have to connect connected to the human, human story, to the human rights. So again, increase awareness and the level of knowledge. Uh, you have to build a lot of transparency and trust. Innovation is key, technological and social innovation at the same time. And again, climate change communication is an emerging science. Uh, that was my contribution. If there are any questions from you or from the audience, of course, I will be very, very able to, uh, happy and able <laughs> to answer them. Happy, able, and capable of yeah. answering wow. then uh, all of the questions that we might be getting now. Thank you very much for all your inputs. And this will be now the uh, magical moment where we open, so to say, the chat function and also invite every participant in the room. We have a steady number of 60 here um, participating that uh, you may want to raise your virtual hand so that I can hopefully see you then and give you the floor. This would be then implemented by the TEPSA team uh, in the back. Now, let me see, are there any questions coming immediately from the audience that we would like to pick up upon? Um, you can drop a message in the chat box and or make use of the virtual hands. In the meantime, there have been some announcements also have uh, been made, but as for the questions, we are still waiting for the first uh, to arrive. So allow me then to take uh, the floor um, and to maybe come up with one of the questions um, to maybe um, also um, um, trigger or push you um, a little bit in the direction uh, of what this book is also all about. Because in the end, to be very frank, I am a strong believer in the European integration process, but I also strongly believe that it's extremely important on matters such as climate change, but we also do address many other uh, topics in the series, such as Euroscepticism, such as uh, the relations with Russia, the new enlargement perspectives um, uh, and or solidarity in action, that whenever it comes to these kind of challenges that we agree we cannot solve at the member state level, um, that we need to find a, a, a higher level um, of abstraction in order to address. Um, it is extremely important whenever we see the European Union as one, not the, but one of the actors, uh, but a very visible actor on this very matter, um, that it is extremely important to understand not only what the challenges are in Germany and in France, uh, because this is normally what we grasp in the newspapers uh, or in the news. Uh, that that's what we very often hear coming uh, directly from Brussels. 
but that it is extremely important um, um, and necessary that we actually get the full picture, um, including all EU member states. Now, you underlined that Romania is also not a very small country, but actually amongst the biggest countries, sometimes quite often forgotten when I give presentations in Germany. This is something I keep need to keep remind everyone in the room. Um, and your perspective is very interesting uh, in many regards from an external point of view, uh, because you have very particular challenges and national challenges um, linked to, um, um, well, to, 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 um, to, to geography on the one hand, um, linked uh, to the history, um, linked to the tradition uh, with fossil uh, energy, uh, the discussions you have, if I'm rightly informed also, or you have been having uh, around nuclear power plants um, 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 and uh, the use of it. Huh? And you see that member states within the European Union are very diversely looking at it. And I'm talking here as a German, uh, that it's not only, um, and uh, the Russia's, the geopolitics, of course, uh, that has um, um, put this uh, pretty much under the strain uh, because it has made energy so much more cost intense. Um, and interestingly, uh, we have countries that depend um, to, to, um, to 95 uh, and more percent on fossil energy still. And we have member states in the European Union that already use more than 40 percent renewable energy. So we have a huge diversity across the European Union. And the challenges you uh, basically addressed are not only uh, are to some extent particular to Romania, uh, but with regard to the recommendations, we see that very often education seems to play uh, an important factor, information uh, campaigns. And my question to you would be, who would be, in your opinion, be responsible for these um, informations and providing the information, the education part? Is this something that you would need to find a Romanian narrative? Is this something where you might actually join forces with other European countries having very similar, um, 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 having very similar um, challenges? Is it something that needs to be coordinated from the European Union level? Um, because you all insisted so much on uh, information, uh, correct information, Right and um, the increase, um, the need for increase in knowledge. Who should provide this? Is it uh, more at the bottom? Is it bottom up? Is it civil societies? Is it the engagement of citizens, as some of you uh, recommended in your uh, chapters, or where would be the actors? Now I leave this as an open question to those who would like to address, um, and um, afterwards uh, we would open. Uh, to the chat because we do have the first questions coming in, but maybe uh, Ciprian, you um, raised your hand. Maybe you want to elaborate yeah. a little bit on this. Okay, so so this is a question that I think we all ask ourselves: uh, whose responsibility is it? Um, and I ask myself that question quite often. Um, and I think the question, the answer, needs another question before. Um, if we understand who has a responsibility, is that enough? Uh, and my answer is absolutely not. Um, if we or some of us might agree that the responsibility to inform, uh, decide, act, etc., is upon the state, member states, and uh, upon the commission and the parliament to some extent, uh, then it feels like we just said, you know, it's their problem. If they don't fix it, we're going to elect somebody else. So I really think that if we just talk about who has the responsibility, we might miss the opportunity to actually say, you know, uh, it's not about who has it. We all have it, first of all. As mentioned, as I mentioned before, um, the... Um, one of the best ways to reduce air pollution right, at least in Romania, is to reduce transportation. Um, it's one of the main um, uh, pollutants in the country. Um, of course, the main pollutants are steel and cement, but it's a different story, right? 
So you can do that, or can citizens do that? That is the question. And some citizens can do that. Most citizens cannot. Why? Because they would need buses or other types of, of uh, local transportation. Um, so we go back to, oh, it's the responsibility of the state. So sometimes, even if it, it, it seems like the solution is of the citizen, so very bottom, bottom, not even bottom up, we still you know, get kicked by the up. Now there are, on the other hand, solutions, and we do see a lot of them, um, you know, for example, presented at, at the Climate Change Summit from around the world, uh, solutions either developed by companies or by citizens, whereas you may reduce your local footprint, and in time you might reduce the local footprint of the country. Because again, if we just answer the question, whose responsibility is it, and we leave that as such, we will lose any type of real uh, solution. Uh, then there's a problem that I have, uh, which think, speaking of books, I hope you can read it in my book in October, uh, which is about this perception of uh, up, uh, up bottom or bottom up. There's something that's missing, which is the middle. The middle, which is not neither the political or the politicians, nor the bottom, which is usually seen as the people. Uh, the middle is the business sector, the SMEs, uh, uh, and the civic sector. These have not just the responsibility, but even the power to put pressure on both sides of the aisle, both up and down, or both up and to bottom, and not just act as a transmitter of information, but act as a educator and pressure point to actually move the needle. I just want to focus on one question from the audience and then I'm going to you know, be quiet for the rest of the, the session, which is about Ukraine um, and whether or not um, how the war is in Ukraine is currently affect, affecting the climate change. I will reverse the question and say, what are the opportunities for climate change that the Ukrainian war is pushed, putting on the table? Um, and the opportunity is the rebuilding of Ukraine. Um, we, as Europe or the West or the US, whatever, we have never since the Second World War been in a situation in which we can build, literally build, a country. Ukraine is a huge country. A lot of it is destroyed. What is the connection to climate change? Well, there's a, a large number of Companies across the world, in particular in the US and, and Western Europe, that's it. So, uh, except you lost me, I think. Um, and one example of that is the many millions of, of uh, cubic meters of, um, how do you call it, uh, uh, cement or bricks that were destroyed in the war. How can you use that to build again? So there's, uh, there's always an opportunity if you look for it. That's my conclusion. Okay, thank you very much. Yes, um, my question was also relating a little bit to the aspect of uh, trust, uh, which you were also uh, elaborating upon, because in the end, it also comes down, whom do you trust that should take a lead on this matter? And here, I think probably also, we see differences across different EU member states. Now, Elisa, before I give you the floor, let me elaborate on a number of questions now, also in view of the time. Let me just read them out um, so that we have them all on our radar, okay? And then I would give you, Elisa, right away the floor and you pick and choose those. Um, I would everyone give a floor to then pick and choose. Um, now, let me see. Uh, we have uh, the question uh, by Mihaela. How can the EU's green claims in initiative uh, to steer the robust climate change actions? Um, we have an anonymous um, participant who raised the question of how the war in Ukraine is currently affecting the climate change. Um, uh, Ciprian uh, elaborated on this one. Another one, can Romania act as a leader for climate change in the EU? And then we have Aurelia, who uh, elaborates a little bit more in detail. How can we manage the climate change effects while not affecting the rural development and the quality of life in the rural areas, especially in Romania, where 
are also dealing with the difference between Romanian and other Western European rural region, regions in terms of development. How can we watch up without affecting? How can we catch up without affecting the quality of life? And then we have Dan uh, Daniela Yazimovic uh, from uh, Montenegro. So we do not only have um, uh, Romanian participants, but a European crowd here. Uh, getting uh, coming in with uh, a number of questions. How to manage the gap between near-term energy needs and the urgent but longer-term green goals? Do we really need to choose between energy security and climate action? And how to manage the gap between near-term energy needs and the urgent but longer-term green goals? That's the questions I have here. Um, and I would give you the floor now, also in view of the time, we still have 10 minutes to go. Elisa, maybe uh, you raised your hand first, that you would give, a, I would give you the floor first, then Mihai and then Alina and Ciprian, in case you still want to add something at the very end, please be my guest. Elisa, please. Thank you so much. I would like to refer to the question that you have addressed uh, previously. Uh, and you have said uh, about the Romanian narrative. Uh, I think a Romanian narrative should start from, from the fact that if climate change is the issue, the problem, maybe climate stability can represent the goal. And uh, for achieving this goal, uh, we need to start from the economic and the social factors that, as we have uh, addressed in our contribution and to frame all the discussions uh, starting uh, starting with this. So how does it currently impact my, my current uh, way of living and uh, the way I'm producing, uh, I'm uh, having different uh, types of uh, economic behaviors, but also what can I do in order to ensure that I have stability in the next uh, in the next uh, few years? And from, from the questions that have been addressed uh, in the chat, I would like just to refer, refer a bit uh, to this uh, this question, can Romania act as a leader for climate change in the EU? Uh, I think we need leaders in all the EU countries and actually all the countries in the world need to act uh, as uh, climate uh, climate leaders. And uh, for doing this, uh, I think one advantage that Romania could uh, uh, present uh, more ambitious at the at the European level would be uh, the pr protection for biodiversity as we have different types of uh, um, uh, plants and uh, animals and so on. And what do we do in this case in order to protect the biodiversity? Maybe it would also uh, be a good point standpoint to to act uh, in terms of uh, climate leadership at the at the European level. Yes. Thank you very much. Um, you picked and chose um, a few questions. Thank you very much for this. Mihai, um, would you like to continue? Yes, concerning your question and some of the questions in the comments, I like to say that we should get rid of the feeling that we have arrived at a party when everyone is closing the tables and getting ready for austerity. And I say that because in my opinion, the, one of the differences between Eastern and Western Europe is the fact that until 1989, we had this communist past with its traumas such as energy crisis, austerity, rationalization of products. And people in the region are no longer expecting, in my opinion, to restart a new program of, let's say, sacrificing, we should sacrifice this energy and that for the greater good, because this term greater good has been so much abused up to 1999, that when we speak about it, we only generate a harsh opposition on that. It's also about climate change. It should be looked in the great context of how to rebuild a community, how to rebuild a nation, because in my opinion, we are still in this process of building a nation and we need to restart to have trust in ourselves, in uh, our action. And that's why when I saw the question of quality of life, someone I remember this, the fact that there is often the feeling that uh, we are the ones that arrive and uh, the cake has been eaten. We are just waiting, let's eat some green stuff and then you go home. Add to this the frustration caused by other EU problems that affect the perception, such as the Schengen case, having pulling all the technical details and saying that due to political reason we cannot in, 
it doesn't help any sort of policy that require uh, mass mobilization and coming together around some common goals. So how to sell climate change, how to maintain and increase the quality of life, if we can provide an answer to this question and you can ensure everyone that nobody is going to be left behind and that we, our children are going to have a better life than our uh, parents, if you can give answer to that, then I believe that the climate change aspect can be much easily expected because having uh, answer, then you need to sacrifice for uncertain future does not help in my opinion. I know it sounds a little cynical, but nobody wants to be a party where there is nothing to drink and eat, so. Mm -hmm. Okay, Alina? Very, very briefly, I think these were great questions. I'm I, I, again, I'm happy that this is a debate. It is not a monologue. I will address the question about uh, the fact whether climate change resolution does not affect development. So I acknowledge the fact that there are regional differences. Mihai Sebe made references to this, and I acknowledge that uh, even if climate change is a global problem, there is not a one-size-fits-all solution. So you have to take into account regional disparities, and that uh, this phenomena finds us in different stages of evolution. So this will be a broad statement. But I think that, uh, so acknowledging the concern of the people, that, of the person that asked the question, I think that this is a false trade-off. Uh, uh, in uh, climate change discourse, uh, sometimes there is that fa uh, false trade-off that we have to sacrifice something, we have to give up our economic development in order to, to fight climate change. I think that this is, I do not want to be very abrupt, but I think that this is a false trade-off. And I'm very, very optimistic exactly of the contrary, that climate change can be a tool for economic development, for restarting economic development for, from better pro premises. And in the case of agriculture, there are, there are thousands, of, uh, thousands of examples po pointing exactly to this with vertical farming, for example or using technology or artificial intelligence in order to increase productivity and to pollute less. So about narratives, I think that we should try to find this kind of narrative that finding cli fighting climate change, it does not mean sacrificing something, losing something, losing productivity, but exactly on the contrary. And again, I think that there are thousands of very um, you know, fresh examples where these kind of things have worked in the field of agriculture, in the field of energy, in the field of transportation. And regarding to the question, who should do it? Of course, this is haunting me in terms of disinformation, for example. I completely agree with the idea that we do not have a bottom-up approach, uh, uh, top-down, uh, left-right, but I think that um, uh, climate, fighting, climate change is something which is at the intersection of different fields, and I can name only few of them, health, energy, agriculture, transportation, and energy. And of course, you have to have the institutions involved you have to have interinstitutional communication, transinstitutional communication, and I think that the, we should think we should consider the role of the state as a catalyst. This is from the literature, the catalyst state, meaning the decision-making power to to bring people to the same table in order to discuss it and to, to promote it further. I think that we, if we leave it at the level of on NGOs or the school should, does, should do it or the politicians will have to do it, we'll have a fight and again, climate change will become a highly polarizing issue. But of course, in order to have the state in a, in a catalyst position, you have to have competence, you have to have experts, you have to be aware, you have to build a lot of trust in order to be able to bring a lot of disciplines and specializations at the same table. Mm -hmm. Yes, thank you. Thank you very much for this. Uh, Ciprian, short and crisp, please. Very short and very crisp uh, an answer to Alina's last Five mm -hmm. seconds ago about people and skills uh what i think we need to put more and more on the table is the the really <laughs> the hardcore challenge that europe faces in the next 10 years which is the, the skills gap the green skills gap there are simply not enough specialists engineers uh, etc that can work 
to really develop the new European green and digital economy. Uh, so what we need to do is also to invest in the educational, not just education of the general public, but in specific, almost technical education uh, for you know, waste engineers all the way to sustainability specialists. Yes, thank you very much. Yes, very nice uh, elaboration on, on almost all the questions we had. Maybe one other or last elaboration from my side on the Russia question and Russia's military intervention or invasion, sorry, of the Ukraine. Um, its implications touch literally all policy areas, including the fight against global warming. Huh? There are clear inter interdependencies between climate change, the reduction of energy dependencies, food sec uh, security, um, um, signaling that transformation of our economies has never been more visible. We have um, countries, and you see this very nicely um, also in this book, when you read beyond the Romanian chapter, which were written by Lisa Vash and Mihai Sebe, um, you will see that, for example, um, as I already mentioned, uh, new nuclear power plants uh, are now to be set up in Belgium, in Finland, so discussions in Romania and Slovenia. Um, we have the importance of coal that came back on the table, huh? also something because of uh, Russia's war in Ukraine, in Bulgaria, in Poland, in Slovenia, and in the Slovak Republic. Um, um, actually, we because, well, basically in order to diversify and uh, reduce the dependencies um, on fossil fuels, specifically on gas uh, coming from, uh, uh, from Russia. And simply forging a war of the extent we are witnessing now since um, early 2022 also produces a lot of pollution with obviously a very immediate effect on climate change. Uh, there are figures uh, making comparisons between uh, the pollution of a country of the size of Belgium um, in comparison to uh, the pollution that is currently taking place uh, by um, implementing the war as we are witnessing it right now, Russia's war in Ukraine. Now, ladies and gentlemen, we come to an end. Um, it's, um, yeah, it's about time that we close uh, this panel. And I hope that we have given you a lot of food for thought for further kind of activities. This is just the kickoff, the start, hopefully, of more to come. And I wish, uh, I will thank all of you, Elisa, uh, Mihai, Alina and um, Ciprian uh, for your interventions. Juana, thank you very much for being a guest um, at your premises. It has been a real pleasure. I give you the last words. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. I think it was an extremely interesting and very dense dialogue. And I'm very happy that we can take with us some uh, key ideas on climate change, on climate stability as a goal, the common responsibility, Climate change communication as an emerging science, the need for the business sector to be more involved in this uh, process, the need for skills, for competences and so on. So I would like to thank you, Michael, for moderating the event and uh, to all the speakers for their insightful uh, inputs and also to the participants. I do look forward to a next joint event on a similar topic and uh, I am more than honored to have been part of this uh, initiative. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Thank you. Greetings to Romania and Europe. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. And thanks, Tepsa, for Bye. organizing all this. Ciao.